Hello, I'm Bob Insersheimer, and I'm here to interview Brett Stevens, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Wall Street Journal and the author of America in Retreat. Brett, what's the retreat all about? Well, it's uh, an America that over the last six years has, in a way that we haven't seen um, in decades, uh, decided that the better course for our foreign policy is to have a lot less of a foreign policy. We are reacting to uh, the perceived overcommitments of the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration. We want less engagement in the Middle East. We want to turn our backs on a war on terror that seems to many people to be uh, unwinnable. We want to uh, pr uh, provide um, less by way of military assurances, firepower in East Asia, in Europe. Um, and this is, uh, this is a replica, in a sense, of uh, America, the pattern of American foreign policy behavior uh, after the First World War. Um, people with a good historical mind know that we had a president named Woodrow Wilson who went to war to make the world safe for democracy. Um, and after the war was over and after it was won, a lot of Americans concluded that, as the British like to say, the game hadn't been worth the candle. And they did not want to remain uh, engaged in global affairs. They did not want to police a, the world order that had been established at Versailles. And so we turned inward in the 1920s under Republican administrations and again in the 1930s for much of the Roosevelt administration, at least until uh, the late 1930s. The retreat I'm speaking of now largely replicates uh, uh, that, uh, that pattern, that history. And the argument I'm making is doing so is not going to mean that our foreign problems are going to abate. Uh, in fact, they're going to become worse. We are inviting a global disorder, which is the subtitle of the book, which is going to come around to haunt us. You know, I started writing this book a couple of years ago. I think now, um, uh, in, at the beginning of 2015, uh, some people might say I've been vindicated with the rise of ISIS, the invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, Chinese aggressiveness toward uh, its neighbors, Iran's steady march to a nuclear, some kind of nuclear capability. So I'm worried about the pattern of American foreign policy. Uh, one of the points that I make is retreat uh, is a choice. It's a choice that one administration has made. It's a choice that another administration can reverse. Okay. Uh, I'm, your book was published in November, so I assume some of our viewers may have read it. A lot have yet to read it. Uh, so we're, we're speaking to both those people who have read it and yet to read it. Um, you make the distinction between retreat and decline. I think page 22, in fact, you say we're in retreat, but we're, right. we're not in decline. <laughs> What's the difference between retreat and decline? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, look, decline is something that happens to countries for reasons that are typically beyond the reach of any one political leader or even several political leaders to reverse. France has been in decline for a very long time. Generation after generation of French political leaders have tried to stem that decline. They haven't succeeded. Japan is a country in decline for reasons that have to do, for example, with demography or attitudes about immigration. Uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has found it really hard to, uh, to turn that around as well. Russia, by the way, is in a tremendous amount of decline. I don't for a second think that the United States is in decline. And there's an entire chapter in the book to explaining precisely, to making that uh, case, that the United States for sure is going to remain the dominant economic, political, uh, social power, if you will, and probably military power uh, throughout the rest of my uh, life, probably uh, my, my children's life as well, and maybe, maybe well, uh, well beyond that. But nations that are, n that are not in decline can still be in retreat because they make these choices. And nations that are in decline, as Russia is, can still be on the march, uh, as, we're, as we're witnessing today. So that's the distinction that I want to draw. And actually, it's because we are not in decline, because we will remain the world's number one, that our enemies um, or our adversaries are still going to be gunning for us in one way or another, whether it's uh, the militants of Islamic, uh, of, the, uh, of Islamic State, whether it's Chinese generals seeking to kick us out of East Asia, whether it's Russian politicians seeking to revise the, uh, the conclusions of the Cold War. Right. You mentioned your subtitle, The New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder. Why coming? 
Right. I mean, you know, someone, uh, I won't say who it was, but a, a prominent person who um, uh, read and liked this book said, I like it very much. The only problem is the word coming. It should be the current global disorder. Uh, but I think, in fact, it's going to be, uh, uh, I'm afraid to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. I think it's going to be worse. For example, um, the fall in oil prices. All of us are celebrating as consumers, at least if you drive a car, not having to pay four bucks uh, uh, for, a gallon of, uh, for a gallon of gas. And we think that it gives us leverage over countries like Russia and Iran that perhaps we didn't enjoy before. My sense, in fact, is that Russia and Iran will become more dangerous as oil prices decline because they're going to seek um, other ways to get out of their economic predicament. Typically, think of a country like Argentina in the early 1980s, also in, uh, reeling economically. What did it do? It invaded, uh, invaded the Falklands. Iraq in the late 1980s, early 90s, again under oil, uh, oil prices falling. What did it do? It invaded Kuwait. So the decline is going to be worse. Now, you asked about the isolationism. And one of the objections to the book uh, that I've heard so far is isolationism is a dirty word. It's almost like, or a dirty term, it's almost like anti-Semitism. Now, I don't believe that. Isolationism is actually perhaps the most venerable American foreign policy tradition. Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, says peace, commerce, and friendship with all nations entangling alliances with none. Isolationism, in many respects, was a foreign policy that served us pretty well when getting from uh, uh, Portsmouth to New York took three, was three weeks or so on a, pa on a hazardous uh, sailing journey. It becomes a much less viable uh, policy alternative when we are 30 minutes away from a, a Russian or a Chinese intercontinental uh, ballistic missile. But isolationism is a serious approach to foreign policy. It's a moral, and I would say moralizing approach to foreign policy. It tells us, you know, on the whole, we ought not to meddle in other people's business. On the whole, foreign policy will inevitably have unintended consequences, and those unintended consequences will come back to haunt us. On the whole, we should be spending our national resources not on a large military, not on bases in Japan or Germany, uh, but right here at home, rebuilding our infrastructure, uh, improving our schools, and so on. And so the, the case for isolationism, or what I call isolationism, is a strong case. It's a smart case, and it has to be dealt with that way. It can't just be dismissed as a bunch of yahoos, because they are making some fundamental claims about what the United States ought to be about. I happen to think they're wrong, but I don't want to dismiss or denigrate them. As a... Uh columnist and editor for the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, I take it you're a conservative. Yes. Is, would you call your book conservative? Yeah, in fact, uh, at the heart of the book is a case for a conservative foreign policy. But conservative doesn't mean George W. Bush's freedom agenda. Uh, and in fact, much of my book is dedicated to criticizing what I see as some dangerous strains in the Republican uh, establishment's foreign policy views over the last decade or so. I mean, when George Bush said in his second inaugural that the policy of the United States was uh, over time to rid the world of tyranny, that struck me as, uh, and I think struck a few other people, as substituting utopianism for foreign policy. Foreign policy exists, like all politics, in the realm of the possible. I don't think we're ever going to find a world free of tyranny, because we're never going to find a world free of human beings with uh, malice and evil and ambition and greed uh, uh, in their hearts. And so suddenly, in the middle of the, uh, of the Bush administration, we became infatuated with this idea that we were going to plant the seeds of democracy in the heart of the Middle East. That strikes me, and I think most of our uh, viewers would agree, as an overly ambitious, if idealistic, and misbegotten foreign policy. Now it's funny, the wheel is turning, and you listen to a lot of people who associate uh, with the Tea Party. I mean, take Sarah Palin. You know, her view of the crisis in Syria was, as she famously put it, let Allah sort it out. Um, I don't believe in the Sarah Palin foreign policy doctrine when it comes to, uh, for example, Syria. Letting Allah sort it out has meant 200,000 people dead. It's meant turning a uh, domestic crisis within Syria into a massive regional crisis. It's created the power vacuum and the chaos which has been filled by